Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Creation Podcast, the show where we discuss the science that confirms scripture. I'm your host, Trey, and my guest today is Dr. Jake Hebert, ICR research scientist and physicist. It's a pleasure to have you here, Dr. Jake. Thanks for having me. So today we're going to be talking about something that we're all very familiar with, uh, at least those of us who go outside sometimes during the day, uh, that big yellow ball in the sky, our sun. Certain both secular and creation scientists agree that it is very important to life, correct? Sure, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the energy from the sun, uh, you know, obviously it gives us light during the day. Um, that energy, you know, the plants use it to grow. And so, yeah, it, it's a big deal. <laughs> it's kind <laughs> I of would important. Say, yeah. I would say it's a big deal. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So the question then is, how old do secular astronomers claim that the sun is? Well, they, they would say it's about 4.6 billion years old, uh, roughly the same age as the Earth, a little bit older than the Earth. Uh, and, but that age is coming from radioactive dating of meteorites. Okay, it, uh, And so obviously we don't think radioisotope dating methods are trustworthy. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't really think that age really has anything to do with reality. Uh, it's kind of funny. There was a well-known solar astronomer named John Eddy who uh, years ago was interviewed in this uh, science magazine. And he, he said, you know, I think we could live with an age of 6,000 years for the Earth and Sun. He said there's not too much in the way of observational data in astronomy to conflict with that. Now, he believed it was 4.6 billion years right. old. Uh, but he he recognized that, uh, you know, there's not really a reason to say that it has to be that old. Um, now, he also said something that was very interesting. He also said in that same interview, he said that the astronomers take their cues from the paleontologist. That, now, you could quibble and say, well, really, it's, they're taking it from the geologist. But yeah, right. we know what he means. Yeah, and that's true. That's absolutely true. They're taking their cues from the Earth scientists who are telling them that the Earth and the Sun are this old. And therefore, they're taking that over into astronomy. That kind of seems backwards, doesn't it? A little bit. <laughs> yeah, well, it seems like most people just kind of assume uh, the other guys got the evidence. Right. You know, and we, when we point out that there's circular reasoning, a lot of people have trouble believing it. But when you do digging, you find, yeah, it's like this guy is assuming this guy has a good argument and the other guy is assuming another guy has a good argument. And what you find, a lot of these ages are not well supported. It's a big old game of he said, she said. Right. Uh, well, that's an unfortunate. Uh, uh, do you have any idea how uh, these secular astronomers say that the sun formed? Well, they claim it formed from this big uh, cloud of gas and dust. Uh, and they've, they've got, you know, they, they, there's something called the nebular hypothesis or nebular theory. There's different variations of it. They've, it's changed a lot over the years, but in its essence, they basically claim everything formed from this rotating cloud of gas and dust. And so, uh, of course, we don't think that's right. right. God made everything in six days, like the Bible says, and he made the heavenly bodies, including the, the, the sun, on day four right. of the creation week. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, we know that the sun was created by God on day four, uh, and we know from our uh, studies of the Bible uh, that the biblical time scale is about 6,000 years. So instead of a sun that is billions of years old, we have a sun that's several thousand years old. Right. Um, so a question there for you then is, what evidence do we have to support uh, a young sun? Well, one, there's one particular piece of evidence, and that is something called the young uh, faint sun paradox or the faint young sun paradox. And uh, it's kind of ironic. Uh, the late Dr. Carl Sagan was one of the first people to point this out, and he's well known uh, for go talking about billions and billions right. of years. Uh, but he pointed out, uh, based on their ideas about how stars change over time, uh, they think that billions of years ago, the sun would have uh, been only about, the brightness would have only been about 70% what it is today. Okay. And as a result, the earth would have been receiving a lot less sunlight and the earth would have been much colder. I mean, it would basically have been freezing. Uh, now, the problem for them, the reason they call this a paradox, is most evolutionists think that Earth has been warm throughout Earth history. Now, there's some of them who are changing. You know, you've now got people talking about snowball Earths and things right. like that. 
But most of them would say that for the most part, it's been pretty warm. You know, the temperature has been warm, uh, especially at the times when life was supposedly just getting started. So what you have is you have one part of the evolutionary story is contradicting another part. But this is not a problem if the sun is just, say, 6,000 years old, because you don't really expect the sun's brightness to change much over just a few thousand years. Um, because, you know, the sun is powered by nuclear fusion. And you can make it, you know, you would think if you give it enough time, there are going to be changes right. in the sun, okay? The brightness will change. But you don't expect that to happen over just 6,000 years. And so it doesn't prove that the sun is young, but it, it's a pretty good argument against it being billions of years old. Now, uh, they will try to get around this. And every now and then, it's kind of funny, you will see popular science news articles where they claim we've solved the young faint sun paradox. Mm. But then a year later, they come out and say, oops, no, we didn't solve it after all. <laughs> My bad. And then there's another, you'll come out a couple of years later, another one saying, well, we think maybe this will work. And then a year later, no, that doesn't work either. Uh, one thing they try to say is that the greenhouse gases on the primordial earth were much more abundant. Mm -hmm. And so that helped to warm things up. One of the big problems with that, though, is that it would take, I mean, you're, you're just saying that basically the greenhouse gases would have to adjust themselves over billions of years just the right amount to exactly balance the solar radiation and to give you a roughly uniform temperature. And that would be a miraculous. Yeah. It, would, it would be especially since they think climate sensitivity is high. Right. Okay. So, you know... It, um, you know, they've convinced themselves that cli our climate is very sensitive uh, and that small changes can have big effects. So it, it, when you say that the climate is sensitive to like that, it makes the problem even worse. Right. And the, the, But the better explanation is that the Earth is not billions of years old. The sun is not billions of years old. And you just haven't had that big a change in brightness over the last 6,000 years. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh well, I have heard personally that the size of the sun is actually changing year over year. Is that accurate? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, I don't know if we could measure it. Uh, there was a popular idea that this among creationists that the sun was being powered by a gravitational collapse. Uh, I think most creationists now agree that it's getting a big, a big hunk of its energy is coming from nuclear fusion. Uh, I don't is I'm not aware that there's any evidence that it's contracting. I could be wrong. I'm not mm -hmm. an astronomer. Uh, but most creationists don't have a problem with the idea that the sun's powered by nuclear fusion. Um, but the, the reason they were kind of excited about the idea of gravitational collapse is that it could, it could provide a lot of energy, but not for billions of years. Right. And so we were thinking, well, that could be an argument that the sun is younger than what the secular scientists were saying. But I think most creationists now agree that, uh, it most it's getting a, a big hunk of its energy from nuclear fusion. There might be a little bit of other stuff going on, but um, uh, most most people don't. Well, we would not try to use that as a, a young as universe an argument. argument. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's good that we can recognize those things. Things that once were like purported as an argument, right. and now we recognize. Hey, no, that's not yeah. an argument. But as far as I know, the young faint sun paradox is very much a problem for the evolutionists. Yeah. That I think that's a, still a good argument. Okay. So we're talking about suns, uh, well, our sun in particular. Let's talk about how uh, it maybe it compares to other suns, because we know that there are other planets out there, other stars. Um, and I, again, I'm not an astronomer. Uh, are there other stars out there that are similar to our sun? Yeah, there, there. It's been very popular for people to denigrate the sun and say it's just a mediocre, mediocre, average ho hum star. And even Carl Sagan said stuff like mm -hmm. that. But what's what they're finding out, though, is there are a lot of stars out there that are similar to our sun in size and color. But those stars can give off violent blasts of radiation, what we call super flares, every hundred years. And if that if that were to happen here to us on Earth, let's just say it would ruin everybody's day. <laughs> We'd have a big old barbecue. We, we have a big problem, okay? <laughs> So the sun, even the secular astronomers are now starting to recognize the sun in some ways is exceptional. Uh, it's, it's more stable than other stars that are comparable to it that we see, that we see in, other, in other places in the universe. Um, and so, of course, that shouldn't surprise us because God designed it with us in mind. 
Right. Yeah. Do we know what it is about the sun that makes it so stable? I don't know if we do. I don't, I don't know if it's obvious why the sun is so much more stable compared to these other stars. Cause these other stars are similar. Right. Uh, but no, but it is, I mean, we know that it's very stable. Okay. Yeah. So what is the sun made of? Like what? basically hydrogen and helium. And okay. there's some, there's some, uh, some other trace elements in there, but it's mainly hydrogen and helium. Okay. Yeah. And how does that work together to create what we have? Like how well, does it produce heat? And the light? heat, the energy is coming from what they call nuclear fusion, where okay. you have hydrogen atoms combining to form helium and there's energy liberated in that process. And, and that's what powers the sun. Uh, so, um, yeah, I don't know if that's terribly exciting, but that's, that, that's basically what's going on. Hey, yes. if you're a nuclear physicist, that right. could be very exciting. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So what we see then instead of billions of years, we see that, uh, there's pretty ample evidence, uh, or at least ample reason to believe that the sun is not billions of right. years old. Uh, instead, it's just a few thousand. Uh, do you have any major closing thoughts here? Anything you'd like to share with our viewers about uh, that big old ball of gas in the sky? Well, uh, one thing that comes to mind is that you will often hear evolutionists say that the sun is the source of all life on Earth. And, and as Christians, uh, that's just we object to that. That's wrong. Okay, mm. It's not. God is the source of all life. And it may, people often ask, well, why did he wait till day four to create the sun? And it may be that he was making a theological point about the fact that he is the ultimate source of life, not the sun itself. In fact, we read, you know, in Revelation, when the Lord comes back, it says the sun's going to go dark and the moon is going to turn to blood. Um, and, you know, and yet uh, people are still going to be here. I, you know, when it says it goes dark, I don't know exactly, does that mean... We're just not, I don't know. I don't know exactly what that means. A little bit left to interpretation there. Yeah, I mean, does it it mean there's no light at all coming from it? Does it mean that there's enough life to support life on earth, but it's not enough to give us uh, light during, you know, during the daytime? I don't know. I don't know what that means exactly, but I think it's interesting that the Bible says that's going to happen, and yet there's still going to be people here. Uh, so ultimately, God is the ultimate source of life, not the sun. And as Christians, we ought to—I think—we ought to remember that, and 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 not go in and accept these casual claims that really um, attribute life to the sun rather than to God. Right. Yeah. That actually brings up an interesting thought that a lot of ancient cultures actually did worship oh, yeah. the sun. Oh yeah. Um, and, and that's just interesting to think about there. Well, it's interesting, you know, in the Bible, in the Genesis account of creation, it doesn't even call it God. It just says it's the greater light. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's almost as if the Lord is downplaying it a little bit. Right. Yeah. And then it works in tandem with the moon to give us right. signs and seasons and right. all of that. Well, uh, it is fascinating. It is necessary for life. Uh, we do need it. We weren't there. Do you think that maybe before... Uh, the sun was created on day four. Where do you, th I mean, I've heard that, you know, light was from God himself at that mm -hmm. point, uh, but maybe. Well, see, well, I mean, there was light. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it, the, in fact, God said, let there be light on, on, on day one. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, how can you have nighttime and daytime if the sun had not yet been right. created? Well, as long as you've got a rotating globe and there's light coming from a particular direction, you've got a daytime night cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter if the light was coming from somewhere other than the sun. That's true. Okay. Yeah. So you don't really need the sun to have that day night cycle. You just need a rotating earth and you need a, a light coming from a particular direction. Thank you so much uh, for being here, Dr. Hebert. We're so grateful that you can share that information with us. Uh, for all of our viewers and listeners, uh, thank you so much for tuning in. This is, of course, The Creation Podcast. You can listen to it on YouTube uh, or wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to give us a like, rate us, review, share, uh, so that we can reach more people with the truth. Uh, and again, I'm Trey, and this is The Creation Podcast. We'll see you next time.